first off uh, to uh, the YouTubers to please share this video. I've said it before, but this is uh, especially for these days that we live in. And um, it's uh, quite surprising that um, I see that so many Christians resort in these days to to milk, to light messages, and to yeah, music, entertainment, I would say, quote-unquote. But uh, this is a time for meat, and uh, we serve meat here. So it means uh, not a five-minute video, it's always longer, and it's always has more depth. But we really need it. This message today is... Uh, an encouragement for the believer and it's uh, for the unbeliever a warning um, so please share it please so the time we live in is um, is a period that is shortly before judgment comes and it's a bit like an approaching wildfire um, you can see the glow in the distance you can feel the heat already and it's, it's threatening and you know it's coming and there's actually nothing you can do to stop it. And we know this kind of situations from scripture. There are throughout the history, the biblical history, there are quite a few examples of this approaching uh, judgment. And um, the Israelites, they experienced uh, uh, this many times. And um, one time that I referred to the last couple of weeks several times is when they were in Egypt. Um, they knew that uh, judgment was coming upon Egyptians and that they would be liberated. Um, but before it came to that, the first plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians, they experienced them as well. They had to go through that as well. And they knew that worse was to come and they had to get ready to leave. And um, we are living in, in similar uh, times, perilous times, as Paul calls them. And um, it, is, um, it is just as Jesus foretold, times where we might feel troubled ourselves. And he, he encourages us, don't be troubled and endure. Uh, these things must come to pass, he says. Um, and we must endure until the end. But at times it may seem so bad, and, and in some places um, where we see uh, Christians struggling with the, the, the current crisis um, yeah, in, in, in South America, in uh, places like Venezuela, Ecuador, but also in, in, in Pakistan and many other places, um, it might feel so bad that, that you think this is the end, um, and the judgment has already come. And actually you see also many... Um, people that, uh, that post things on, on the internet, they are talking about the seals and the judgment of God and they are already ahead of, um, of things. Um, and yeah, it does seem bad and um, it is bad uh, often. Uh, so it, it might seem that way and despair might overtake. And this is a danger that we are in, that despair might overtake us and um, we lose control and we could lose a lot more than just that um, and we see a very um, strong example of that is where i want to go today because it's so helpful to us and that is with, with the prophet jeremiah uh, he was in this uh, call it a winter of despair the thing he knew judgment was coming god had revealed it to him and um, he was of course the, the messenger to deliver the bad news and uh, uh, it, it was too much for him. So this was shortly before uh, Judah would fall in the hands of the Babylonians. This was the judgment, um, part of God's judgment. And it was a very bad time. And so what happened at some point, Jeremiah began to complain to God. He was, uh, he was, uh, it was too much for him. And so right away you can ask yourself, do we or do I complain to God when things are getting bad? Am I complaining? Why is this happening? Why do you allow me to suffer like that? Is this 
Because this may be on your heart. And I know for some it is. And so we can see what Jeremiah did and how God responds to that. What we see in this uh, time is, um, oddly enough, but again, nothing new under the sun, is that it's exactly those that we expect to be judged uh, eventually, they are doing well. They are prospering, while God's people are suffering. And so we, we, we often wonder why is this happening, but, but that's exactly what God foretold, what Jesus said, you must endure you will um, find tribulation in this world. Um, so that's what Jeremiah experienced, and he, he is complaining to God. And we want to go to Jeremiah uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12, and I will read the first, few, first four verses. So Jeremiah is speaking. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yet they have taken root. They grow, yet they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tr tried my heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare, prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn, and the herbs of every field wither, for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed, and the birds, because they said, He shall not see our last end. It's a complaint, and you have to read a little bit between the lines to see what, what's on Jeremiah's heart. But um, what he describes here in uh, verse 4 is that the whole nation is suffering. It's falling apart. And he says uh, that uh, uh, the wickedness of them that dwell therein. These are the people that live in, in Judah in this case. Um, he's not talking, um, at least here, he's not talking about the leadership. He's talking about the people that dwell therein. All the people, the citizens, the inhabitants. And um, he says then they have taken root. They have established themselves. And, and they, they bring forth fruit. They do well. In, the, in their wickedness, they do well. And they are prospering. But their activities have a detrimental effect on the environment. He's then talking about the herbs of the field that wither and how the, the animals even are suffering. And so you, you can recognize this in our days. It should be very familiar to what we see around us. Now, Jeremiah is very serious when he says that he wants to talk um, about... Uh, about this to God, and it's it's kind of funny in um, the first verse, and he begins to say, Righteous are thou, Lord, when I plead with thee. So he's saying, okay, I know you are righteous, you're God, but then he said, yet, eh, but let me talk with thee of thy judgment. So eh, he's basically saying, I have to talk to you a little bit about your judgment, because something's not right here. And that's that's the, the, the way he brings it. And... Um, he then says, uh, you know me. I am not the bad one. You've tried my heart. Why am I suffering? Bring them to the slaughter. Not me. Pull them out. Not me. That is his complaint. He feels he is suffering while all they that do uh, wicked, they are doing well. In all the bad, the wicked are prospering. They take advantage of others. They take advantage of the circumstances. And it was, yeah, when I was reading this the past weeks, uh, I read this, um, this um, uh, news headlines that uh, in the United States, uh, so many uh, millions had lost their job. And by now it's 26 million people lost their job in only five weeks' time. And... Um, when this was reported, there was another headline that uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon uh, made in, in that one night uh, $6.5 billion uh, he added to his wealth. And so you see that many suffer, but some are prospering. And not necessarily saying that Jeff Bezos is the, is the wicked one, but um, I think you, you get uh, the gist. So we see this, that... 
many people are uh, taking advantage of, of this crisis. And then we can ask ourselves, like Jeremiah, why does God allow this? And why do we, maybe, or do you have to suffer? And this reminds us, of course, of Psalm 73, where it's the exact same theme. Um, and this psalm uh, written by uh, Asaf, um, we will read a bit from it. This has, this has the same complaint. And I will read it from um, the complete Jewish Bible to, to just get a bit better idea of the feeling there. But I will put on the screen the King James uh, translation. So Psalm 73, um, I begin at verse 1. He begins very much the same as uh, Jeremiah does. First he says, uh, uh, how, good, um, uh, how good God is to Israel, to they, those that are pure in heart. It's exactly what Jeremiah says, hey, you are righteous in your judgment. But, and then comes the complaint, and he does the same here. Verse 2, but as for me, I lost my balance. My feet nearly slipped when I grew envious of the arrogant and saw how the wicked prosper. For when their death comes, it's painless, and meanwhile their bodies are healthy. They don't have ordinary people's troubles. They aren't plagued like others. So for them, pride is a necklace, and violence clothes them like a robe. Their eyes peep out through folds of fat. Evil thoughts overflow their, uh, from their hearts. They scoff and speak with malice. Their loftily, uh, they loftily utter threats. They set their mouths against heaven. Their tongues swagger through the earth. And in verse 12, Yes, this is what the wicked are like. Those free of misfortune keep increasing their wealth. It's, for, it's all for nothing that I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands, staying free of guilt. For all day long I am plagued. My punishment comes every morning. Here you see how he says, I am suffering so much and they are doing so well. It's unfair. It's unfair. It's the same complaint that Jeremiah has, but there is also a difference. Asaf sees something as this psalm progresses that Jeremiah is not seeing. Not at that point, at least. Asaf continues and he says then in verse 18, uh, indeed, you place them on a slippery slope and make them fall to their ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakens. Lord, when you rouse yourself, you will despise their phantoms. And uh, in verse 27, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who adulterously leave you. But for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, so that I can tell of you all your works. So he says, yes, he sees their end. They, will, they do well, and they are, like Jeremiah says, established. They, they have taken root, they produce fruit in their wickedness, but their end comes suddenly, like waking up from a dream. And uh, that is actually what we find... Um, Elsewhere in scripture, um, just to have a few examples that speak of this, this suddenly, suddenness of the, the, in the way the destruction comes, uh, in um, Proverbs 29, the first verse, it says there, He that being often reproved hardened, hardened his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. It comes and it comes suddenly, and then there is nothing they can do to stop it. Also, a few pages further in your Bible, in Ecclesiastes um, chapter 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of man is fully set in them to do evil. This judgment, it doesn't come right away. It will come, but it will come actually late. Late and suddenly, but because they don't see it, they don't see it coming, or they, they prosper in their wickedness, that's why they, the heart is set to do it even more. Um, and that's what is being uh, said here. It's fully set in them to do evil, because they see that it brings, brings fruit to them. 
but it will come and it will come suddenly. And of course, Paul then writes to the Thessalonians about the sudden destruction that will come at the end of the age, which very much uh, refers to our time that we live in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape without remedy. There is nothing they can do. It's like you're maybe in a pleasant dream, but then the alarm clock goes, you wake up, and it's, it's vaporized, it's gone, and there's nothing you can do about it. So Asaph sees this, but Jeremiah cannot see beyond this wickedness and um, beyond the prosperity that um, the wicked have. And he cannot see beyond the injustice of his own suffering. And this is a danger that can easily befall us, that we see all this bad stuff happening around us, that we see that some are doing very well, and, and it seems unfair to us, and at the same time we are suffering, we are not able to, to have the life we desire, or we think even maybe that we deserve, and, um, and, and then we we stuck in this. And this is what happened to Jeremiah. Jeremiah um, Jeremiah's complaints are heard by God, but God is not, um, is not happy with it. God makes him see that uh, his complaints are actually um, not justified. Back to Jeremiah chapter 12. And this is something, um, what is said here in this verse, is very important for us today. Um, Jeremiah 12 verse 5. This is God's report response to Jeremiah, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? So what is God saying here to Jeremiah? Um, he is talking about footmen and horses. Now, that's an um, analogy um, referring to, um, to the armies of those days. When they went to the battlefield, um, the armies were mainly footmen, meaning soldiers just walking uh, with their, their uh, sword, spears or, or bows or what, whatever they had, but they were on foot and they were just running uh, towards the other army. Uh, but then there was a second wave uh, in the army and these were men on horses. Now, horses were like today you would have tanks in the army. These, these were powerful, they were fast, uh, and, and so uh, that was um, more intense. Um, so God is saying, you are now, you're, you think you're suffering, you're just running with a footman. You're running with others that are running, just like you, on, on their feet. Wait until you have to run with the horses and try to keep up with them. In other words, you think it's bad now. You have not seen anything yet. Much worse is to come. Don't complain to me. Much worse is to come. Uh, to say it popular, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. This is a message for us today. We think that things are bad now. We're just walking or running with the footmen. We haven't seen anything yet. Much worse is to come and it's gonna come soon. So far, Jeremiah only had to deal with Jerusalem. And uh, God is, is basically saying, wait until I'm done with all of Judah. Then you will know what, uh, what uh, is going on. These times before the judgment are turbulent times. And still, it is relative calm before the storm. It is still calm before the storm. It is, as Jesus puts it, only the beginning of sorrows. And it's the time where God lifts his um, protective hand from his people, as he did in Jeremiah's time. God is not doing anything to them. He's just going to lift his protective hand so that the enemies uh, of Israel are free to, to, to overcome them. Uh, it's not yet 
judgment of God in that sense that God is actively um, throwing plagues upon them but um, the protective hedge is going to be removed and that is what God says then to Jeremiah in verse 7 I have forsaken mine house I have left my heritage I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies this is what is happening now and God does so because his people are rebellious they are apostate and when the protective hedge is removed from around the sheep what happens is that the wolves will attack there's no other way so there is very much a parallel with our times today this is what's happening and God then begins to or continues to explain um, how how it came to this point why does this happen how did his people and his land get in this position and that is in verse 10 many pastors have destroyed my vineyard they have trodden my portion underfoot they have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness they have made it desolate and being desolate it it mourneth unto, unto me the whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart he speaks here King James translates it with the pastors and the words then used in Hebrew there can indeed be translated with pastors and it's actually a good translation because it, it gives us some um, perspective but it can also mean shepherds or rulers so it's shepherds the rulers of, of the land that have destroyed destroyed God's vineyard they have they were, were not good stewards at all so as Jeremiah uh, complains to God about the inhabitants of the land uh, God now uh, points to the to the pastors to the rulers they have um, caused and of course there is this tandem there uh, the, the people get the rulers that they choose that they uh, submit themselves to and uh, the rulers do what uh, the peop people allow them to do it, it goes in tandem but it's the rulers it's, it is actually the cause of all this is mismanagement of uh, people in authority and this is um, this is in general in the world this is what's happening it's mismanagement of of people in authority and in the church we see the exact same thing mismanagement of those with spiritual authority and that's why pastors is actually a good translation because it's actually really what's happening and um, this does not happen by accident this is not uh, just a coincidental way of how things uh, went no um, they had um, these rulers they have invested time and effort to create this to get to this point and this is what he says then in verse 13 they have sown wheat but shall reap thorns they have put themselves to pain but shall not profit and they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord they have sown wheat if you sow wheat uh, or any seeds in a field you have to first prepare the field uh, and then you have to sow it and then you have to to, um, to water it to take out the, the bad weeds and, and all this it takes time it takes patience and it takes it takes effort before it will bring forth fruit but as Jeremiah already said in his complaint they have established themselves and they are um, they, they have the fruit of their wickedness so they have invested lots of time and lots of effort to get to this yeah, God says they have put themselves to pain it didn't just happen overnight and this is what we see today in the world also it didn't just happen and it doesn't just happen it is a long-term effort of, um, of wicked forces to get to this and, um, and, they, and they're not there yet they will continue and of course behind this is Satan um, who has his, uh, his own agenda um, and because of all this um, because of the wickedness of the inhabitants and because of the mismanagement of the shepherds God 
takes away his protective hand. He has worn them so many times, and now he says, "You will, you will find now the result of this, the consequences." In verse uh, fourteen, thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck them out of the house of Judah from among them. God takes away the protective hedge and the wolves will attack. So God is, this is God's response to Jeremiah. He is, God is basically um, disclosing to Jeremiah why this is happening. So that he understands and he's also disclosing to Jeremiah that the worst is yet to come. This is not it yet. So brace yourself because um, if you think this is hard... You're not ready for the next wave. But Jeremiah is not comforted by God's words. And again, this is now something we have to look in the mirror and say, are we comforted by God's words? Because he has done the same to us that he does to Jeremiah. God has disclosed exactly why the things are happening the way they are happening in the world. He has also disclosed that it's going to get much worse than this and that we need to endure and... Uh, Indeed, we are just running with a footman now. Um, we have all this information. And so, are we comforted by that? Or are we like Jeremiah, um, who was not happy at all and not satisfied at all? And actually, he continues to complain and, and worse. That's something we have to ask ourselves. And uh, if we are like Jeremiah, uh, even a little bit, then we, can, we will continue to learn how God responds to this and what he expects from us to do. So knowing God's plans ahead of time and understanding the reason why they happen does not necessarily make one feel okay, comfortable with it. This is, this is a conclusion. It didn't to Jeremiah and uh, on top of that, Jeremiah was the one to, to deliver the bad news. He had to deliver the bad news. And um, again, we are in the same position. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, which means you have to show the difference. You have to, to make clear to the others what's going on and what's wrong. So we have to also deliver the bad news. Now, fortunately, we can also give the good news with it. We can give the bad news, but then we have the answer, the good news as well. But like Jeremiah, we will not be appreciated for it. So... God continues, um, because of uh, Jeremiah's uh, reluctance to make the picture even more grim, and we skip a bit, we go to Jeremiah chapter 15, uh, first verse. God makes clear that he is very serious and that uh, nothing, uh, nothing is going to change his, uh, his mind, so to speak. Then the Lord said unto me, even if... Uh, Moses and Samuel were standing in front of me. My heart would not turn toward this people. Drive them out of my sight. Get them out of here. And when they ask you where they should go, tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death. Those destined for the sword to the sword. Those destined for famine to famine. Those destined for captivity to captivity. I will assign them four kinds of scourges says the Lord, the sword to kill, dogs to draw away, birds in the air and wild animals to devour and destroy. I will make them an object of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, etc. He makes a very graphic picture here. Of he's, He has no, uh, no mercy at this point. Uh, this judgment is going to come in verse uh, 6, second half. He says, so I'm stretching out my hand against you. I'm tired of sparing you. I am destroying you. With a winnowing fork, I'm scattering them to the wind at the gates of the land. I'm bereaving them, destroying my people, because they will not return from their ways. Their widows increase in number, more than the sand of the seas. So, if Jeremiah already had a hard time accepting the situation, now... Um, this is too much. He cannot digest this. And uh, it, it, uh, it shakes him really to the core. Uh, he then says, 
in verse 10, Jeremiah, as a, as a response to this, Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. He is he's saying, I wish I was never born. And then he makes a very kind of funny uh, statement. Uh, he says, I, I have never uh, borrowed money with interest, nor lent money with interest. In other words, he's saying, I'm not, I'm not a banker. And still everyone is hating me. This, I found this kind of funny. Uh, bankers, even in those times, were people that were really hated. And it's, it's even um, against God's word to, to put interest on, on loans uh, and to enrich yourself that way. And so it's, it's a funny note, you could say, that he uses this to say. But he says, I have not done any wicked things uh, in any way, but everyone is hating me. I wish I wasn't born. This is his, this is his uh, response. And uh, the thing is that Jeremiah's response is not based on what has happened, based on, what, on hearing what is going to happen. And so this is typically what I have uh, experienced over the past years when you talk with, with fellow Christians about things that are going to happen, eschatology, end times, prophecy, things that are in scripture that God has told beforehand, um, they don't like to hear this. And they, they do the same that Jeremiah does. They put their heels in the sand and they say, no, I, I don't want this. Um, we will see it when it happens, which is a very silly response if you think of it. It's overwhelming to many and so um, they, they, they just reject it altogether. And uh, that's, of course, a big error. God says to Amos uh, that he never does anything before first revealing it to his prophets. And so this is happening here exactly the same. Uh, but Jeremiah, um, he's ready to give up. He's ready to resign. And God is not well pleased with that. That was not why God raised him up. And uh, giving up or being depressed, because Jeremiah is truly going into a depression here. Um, if you say these things, uh, I wish I was never born, and, and everyone hates me, this, is, this shows that this is, he has a depression, and he has a big crisis of faith. This giving up, this depression, this is not part of God's playbook, and um, God is not pleased with that at all. And so he's going to now give... Jeremiah uh, three things, uh, a heavy rebuke, a strong reminder, and reassurance. And then three R's there, rebuke, reminder, reassurance. So again, if you find yourself in any way in this position, in this way of thinking, what God, how God responds now, this is, this is for you. Well, first of all, um, God gives Jeremiah hope. It is not only destruction and, and, and misery, there is hope. In verse 11, it says, The Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. He says, It will be well with thy remnant, your remnant. You will not be alone. You think you're alone and that everyone hates you. This is a typical thought of someone who's depressed. He thinks he's the only one that is... And everyone is against, uh, against him. God says, no, you're not alone. And uh, you might uh, feel alone now. And this is what we experience also. We feel often alone, like crying in the desert. There's no one that listens to us, but God says, no. You're not alone. He gives actually the very same response here to uh, Jeremiah that he gave to Elijah when he had a similar crisis of faith uh, in 1 Kings uh, 19. Um, Jeremiah had, did, had exactly the same. Um, Elijah had exactly the same as Jeremiah. He also said, I wish I wasn't born. 
just strike me dead now and uh, it's over because I'm sick and tired of it. This was basically what he said to God. And so in 1 Kings 19 verse 18, uh, God says to him, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which had not kissed him. He says, you're not alone, there are more. You might see it now, not see it now, but there are more. Don't uh, overreact. So, uh, God even promises to Jeremiah that uh, the enemy will entreat him well in the time of evil. But, Jeremiah is still not satisfied. His crisis is deep and it's serious. Um, he's not comforted. In verse 15, um, he continues then, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I said not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I said alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Why is my pain per perpetual, and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar, and as waters that fail? Now you read this, uh, and, and, yeah, of course King James' uh, language is very, uh, very high, and it sounds all very, um, uh, how do I say, official, but it, it, it's, he's really in a deep crisis here. Um, he is saying to God, you know me, I was always obedient and I always did what you, what you wanted me to do. I love your word. It was a joy to me. I was eating. It was my food. And uh, I did not choose the side of those who mock. I was the one who was alone, never, never uh, part of, uh, of the quote-unquote fun of the others. And, and yet I'm suffering. And I'm suffering every day, all the time, perpetual. And my wound is incurable. But then he goes so far as to call God a liar. Will you be unto me as a liar? And this shows how big his crisis is. Here is the prophet, the man of God, and he, um, he calls God a liar. And he says, and as waters that fail. The word of waters here is a wadi uh, in Hebrew. And wadi is a stream that... Um, it often dries up, especially in the summer. So when, when nomads were traveling, um, they would know there is uh, so many miles ahead, there is a wadi, and I can have drink on my camels and all this. But then you would reach it, and it would be dried up. It's a water that fails. And this was very bad, of course, because you had to travel again, who knows how far, to find the next brook or stream of water. So uh, that's what you can't trust. You can't trust it. So he, this is what he's saying to God. I cannot trust you. You, you lie to me. Um, he has a deep crisis of faith. Big doubts about God. He is at the point, or beyond it, I would say, of what Asaph describes in Psalm 73, where he says, um, I lost my balance. Eh? almost lost my faith. Well, Jeremiah here, he's... he's at that point. And when you lose your faith, you become unusable for God. And um, God is not pleased at all with Jeremiah's weakness of faith. And so after giving him hope, and the response is, is actually even worse now, God rebukes him. It's verse 19. Therefore thus saith the Lord, if thou return, if thou return, then I will bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious for, from the vial, thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. God tells you, my, you must return. Return in Hebrew, it's shuv. Uh, this is uh, the root word, which means and literally that, return or turn around, which we find in the word teshuva, which means repentance. You must repent. You're sinning. 
of course you're sinning if you call God a liar. Obviously. Uh, if you don't trust God, if you reject what he promises you, that's a sin. God says you must repent, you must return. Return from your mistake, return from your distrust. Only then can he be the prophet of God again. He says, then you can be my mouth again, or you can be my spokesperson. If you stay in this, I cannot use you. I raised you up as a prophet, but if, if, if this is the way you go, I can't use you. God is saying, in other words, in other trans, more modern translations, use this, uh, this verb, uh, he says, stop talking nonsense. Don't be a fool and repent. You're behaving like a child. Then I will bring you back. And then I'll let you continue to be my spokesman. God is not impressed by Jeremiah's complaint. Uh, this is a time of serious crisis and... God needs a servant that he can trust, in whom he can have confidence and who doesn't have fear. And this, again, this is for us today. If we let things overwhelm us and we begin to doubt God and his words and his promises, um, this will bring us to the same point. Um, God cannot use us. And God is, this is what God is saying to us, return from this, turn around, stop with this nonsense and with uh, this self-pity uh, because this way I cannot use you. But if you turn around, yes, then, then we can continue. Jeremiah can no longer be a prophet unless he overcomes his doubts and begins again to trust God, unless he separates himself from the ways of Judah. And this is what God says. Um, don't um, uh, let, uh, uh, yeah, return not unto them. Don't go to them. Don't do as all the wicked people around you do. But let them return to me, or to you eh, in this case. So if you are indeed the salt, then there will be people that see the difference and that will look and turn to you. Why are you not depressed like all the others? Why are you not panicking? Why are you not full of fear? Or whatever it may be. And this is the position that he should have. Now he is like all the others. Um, so we must separate, separate ourselves from the ways of the world. Otherwise God cannot use us. The world must come to us and not that we conform to them. So, after this strong rebuke, God now uh, encourages Jeremiah. That's in verse 20 and 21. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, to save thee, and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Very strong um, promise that God gives him here. And the, the ironic thing is, that this is not the first time that God says this to him. At the very beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, this is what God told him. There is nothing new that he didn't know already. This, again, is the same for us. There is nothing new that we know, or at least can know, already. That's why it's so important that we, we eat this, and we eat the meat of it. And that's why it's frustrating to see that even in these days, when, when these things that God foretold begin to unfold so clearly before our eyes, that many Christians just keep sucking milk. And they, they just basically ignore the reality and the truth of God's word. Um, if we go to Jeremiah chapter 1, so the very beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, we see what God promised him ahead of time. Um, and in verse um, 18 of chapter 1, it is practically 
the same as what we just read in chapter 15. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, and against the princes thereof, and against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. It's the same words. So what God is doing in chapter 15, he is not giving him um, something new. He is reminding him. He's saying, have you forgotten what I have promised? Do you indeed think I'm a liar and I'm not keeping my word? I am faithful. That's what he's saying. This is what I've promised. This is what I will do. And so this is the way we have to live and in these times. We have to stand by God's word, know what he has promised us and not fall into depression thinking that all is lost because it is not. It was a very bad time in uh, Jeremiah's days. There was a lot of wickedness in Judah and God was about to pour out his wrath. And therefore Jeremiah's job was not easy and therefore the position that we have now, today, in this world, it's not easy. In chapter 1, verse 16, so this is at the beginning, before uh, the whole ministry of Jeremiah begins, God tells him, And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense upon the, unto their gods, and who worship the works of their own hands. God foretold, this is what I'm going to do, and this is the reason why I'm going to do it. And what we just read there in verse 18, he mentions all the, uh, the people that are involved. It's the kings, it's the, the princes, the priests, and the people, the inhabitants. All of them are uh, guilty and um, ripe for judgment. It's not an easy job. In verse 10 of chapter 1, um, God says to Jeremiah, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. This is a heavy uh, task that he puts on his plate. And um, yeah, we can of course on the other hand understand that um, it's just one man in this, in this land. Uh, and it, it was too much for him at some point. And so God reminds him of his former promises. And he does the same to us. Uh, things might overwhelm us or we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. We have to return to his word. And what did he promise us? In verse 17 um, of chapter 1, God says then to Jeremiah, Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise. Speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. Ahead of time, God has said, just do what I tell you to do. Don't be dismayed. And what we just read in chapter 12 and 15 is exactly that. He's dismayed because all are hating him. And um, uh, yeah, God was reminding him of what he promised him. Chapter 1, verse 17. So today, in 2020, Times are even worse than in Jeremiah's days. And the coming tribulation will even be more fierce than the Babylonian captivity that was a judgment in those days. And so as God's people, we must stand strong and be faithful. And uh, certainly, uh, like uh, Jeremiah, doubts may come. Um, but we must remember God's words, uh, God's words to Jeremiah that we just read. If you change and turn to me, then I will take you back and then you may serve me. So never should our doubts um, make us doubt God and his promises because then we become unusable and we may even lose it altogether. God has given us very powerful promises and we should not forget them. And we should also not forget this verse um, where God says in all these complaints uh, that Jeremiah has, uh, you're just running with a footman. 
if you're complaining now, what are you going to do when you have to run with a horseman? And, and this is this is what we uh, face today. Many think this it cannot get worse than this. Well, it will get worse than this. It will get worse than this soon. And um, so don't lose heart now, but stand on God's word and His promises. And um, He can He can use us uh, mightily, uh, and it's necessary. We need uh, we need this. Um, this encouragement and this power and we need the meat that he offers us because if we only drink milk we will not be strong enough we will not be strong enough we need meat to prepare ourselves for what's coming amen